All right. So, hi everyone around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and、uh, good evening. Welcome to the online Oom tutorial. I hope and your、uh, you and your loved ones are doing、uh, fine in this unusual time. This is Xin Fan from University of Denver.、Uh, this tutorial series are organized by Kirill Balashenko from University of Nebraska and me, sponsored by the IEEE Magnetic Society. The goal is to bring useful and important knowledge on magnetism to everyone staying at home. Um, the micromagnetic simulation software WOMF is among the most popular requests.、Uh, we figure who are better to teach such a tutorial than the WOMF creators. So we reach out to Dr. Mike Donahue. We're very grateful that he agrees、uh, right away, and we'll do four consecutive sessions,、uh, from basics to advanced topics in WOMF. Today will be the first episode of this、uh, series.、Um, Dr. Donahue is a group leader of the mathematical software group at NIST. Uh, he received a PhD in math in 1991, and then a PhD in engineering in 1992 from the Ohio State University. He worked as an industrial postdoc research associate at University of Minnesota, and then subsequently as an NRC postdoc at NIST Gaithersburg. Since 1996, he became a permanent staff at NIST,、uh, where he worked with、uh, Dr. Donald. Dr. Donald Porter and uh, Dr. Uh, Bob McMichael to develop the WOMF、uh, software. We're also very grateful that Dr. Porter, the other creator of WOMF,、uh, is also here today to help moderate this、uh, tutorial session.、Uh, Dr. Porter received his doctor's degree from Washington University in 1996. After、uh, an NRC postdoc, he joined the NIST permanent staff in 1998. He's a member of the mathematical software group of the Information Technology Laboratory, where he works on WOMF and serves as a TICO、uh, core team.、Um, for their work on the WOMF project, Dr. Donahue and、uh, Dr. Porter received the、uh, 2018 Jacob uh, uh, Rabinow Applied Research Award from NIST. In the award announcement, it says more than 2,500 journal articles and 18 U.S. patent application reference use of the WOMF system. I'm sure the number will be even higher after this tutorial series.、Uh, now, before we start the tutorial, let me、uh, discuss how it will be carried out. First of all,、uh, all participants、uh, should be muted and kept the camera off to save bandwidth. If you have any question during the session, Please send those questions as private messages to the moderators. Now you can find the moderators. Uh, um, uh, the moderators will then compile the questions and then、uh, send them to the lecturer, Dr. Donahue. If you click the participants、uh, button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, participants, and in the pop-out menu, you can find a list of names. So the moderators will be uh, me, uh, Dr. Kirill Balashenko, and uh, uh, Dr.、Um, Uh, Donald Porter, and uh,、um, so you can right-click the the names and uh, uh, click chat. Then you can send a private、um, message to the moderators.、Um, please choose the moderator that has a thumb up symbol. If there's a some thumbs down next to the name, that means that the moderator is busy compiling the questions. Then please、uh, send the question to another moderator with a thumb up. Uh, so for people watching this on Twitch, you can type the questions in the chat box. By the way, you may have to register with Twitch in order、uh, to be able to to to、uh, to type the in chat. Due to the large size of participants, we will not be able to answer all the questions. So for future questions, they can be asked in、uh, the NanoHub group, which will be、uh, announced by Dr. Donahue later. So、uh, without further ado, Dr. Donahue, you have the floor. All right. Let's see. We can stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Can you see me now? All right. Yes. A second. Okay. So thank you very much for that、uh, kind introduction.、Um, this is the start of the Oomph tutorial series.、Uh, okay. So um, uh, yeah, let me um, 
I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, a, little, a little tough getting started here. This is the first time I've done one of these uh, big Zoom sessions. So uh, I want to thank especially, though, uh, to the online Spintronic Seminar in Virgin and, uh, and Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Professor Belashenko for reaching out for me and offering me this opportunity. This is a wonderful thing, and I hope we all um, have benefit from it. I also want to thank the people at NanoHub, in particular Tanya Faltons, for helping uh, set up um, resources that we're using there for OOMF and the forum, which we'll discuss some more later, um, where there'll be between sessions, we'll have discussions on, on the uh, OOMF forum at NanoHub. And of course, also the IEEE Magnetic Society for endorsing uh, this event and making this whole thing possible, advertising and so on. Uh, okay, so this is my um, table of contents for today. Uh, I'm going to start out, this is a very, very slow start, um, introducing people to micromagnetics for people who are not really familiar with it at all. So I'll, I'll give a little bird's eye or maybe a squirrel's eye view of what micro micromagnetics is, just so we understand what sorts of things we can do, what we can do with it, what you can do with it. Um, and then once we get past that uh, top level view, then I'll go into a little bit more details. I'll talk about some of the theory behind micromagnetics. I'll talk about the two main types of stimulations that we do, quasi-static simulations and uh, dynamic simulations. And uh, that'll be the bulk of the presentation today. And then towards the end, I'll do some installation demonstrations on Windows. Uh, I'll show you how to use Nano, how to use them for NanoHub, which if you're not familiar, is a great way to get started, especially because you don't have to do any installs and you can run uh, oomph uh, in a web browser from anywhere. Uh, on NanoHub. But then I'll also show how you can install on Windows, and I'll do the Mac. And while I'm doing the Mac install, I'll also discuss um, what's needed to do on, on Linux. Okay, oh, this is, uh, I work for NIST, a uh, government agency, and we have rules. I have to put up the disclaimers. I will be mentioning some trademark names like Windows and Mac OS, already have. Um, these are, uh, these, these mentions are for identification purposes only. Uh, you know, not uh, in any way express or implied uh, our endorsements of the products. Yeah, I wanted to discuss a little bit about the organizational structure um, at OMS just to help people know uh, a little bit more about who I am and um, where I work. So uh, I'm the group leader uh, for the mathematical software group, uh, which lives inside the mathematics, the applied and computational mathematics division inside NIST. That division is part of the Information Technology Laboratory. There are currently half a dozen laboratories in NIST. Um, Jen mentioned uh, the co-creator, one of the co-creators of OOMF was Bob McMichael. He's in a different lab now. He's in the PML, Physical Measurement Laboratory. Uh, so these laboratories then are inside the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which underwent a name change in sometime in the 80s. Prior to that, it was the National Bureau of Standards. It was founded in 1901, so we have a, we have a long history. Uh, we are inside, this is inside the Department of Commerce. And one of the main goals um, for NIST, being inside the Department of Commerce, is to support commerce through um, standards, through our work on standards and uh, our work on technical, technological innovation. And then after that, it just goes on up. This is a cloud. Maybe you should have labeled it. I'm sorry I drew that by hand. Um, but we go farther on up into the US federal government. Down below, um, as I mentioned, I am the, the group leader uh, for the mathematical software group. There's a lot, we have a lot of different projects in our group. I do wanted to mention, in addition to OOMF, uh, I wanted to mention a couple others which may be of interest uh, to people in this audience. Uh, one of them is called OOF, which I think used to stand for Object Oriented Finite Elements, but it's now just labeled the Finite Element Analysis of Microstructures. And this is a great tool. It's actually also on NanoHub. It's been on NanoHub even longer than OOMF has been. And um, you can do lots of sorts of finite element simulations of materials with it. But one of its claim to themes is you can start with a micrograph and then you go in using the tools in this package, you go in and you identify the grains and other physical structures in the micrograph. And then you map that to a fin into a finite element simulation. And then you can run all different types of multi-physics simulations uh, on your actual sample. So please check that out. Like I said, it's on Oof, it's on, sorry, it's on NanoHub. So you can just log on there. You can try it without having to download or install anything. And it's also free software like them. And so please check that out. The other thing I wanted to mention is the DLMF, which is actually, I think the largest project uh, in, in my group. 
you may be familiar, some of you may remember this handbook of mathematical functions, uh, Abramowitz and Stegen, which was published back in the 60s. This a DLMF is a su successor to that, um, which was released, I don't know, a decade ago, well, five, six, seven years ago now. Uh, it's an online version of the handbook, of the handbook. lots of equations, lots of formulas for special functions. Um, so, you know, Bessel functions, hybrid geometric functions, elliptic integrals, orthogonal polynomials, the list just goes on. It's an extended, we have more functions than we had back in, in the 60s, and it's online. You can click through the different sections, there's all the links, it makes it very easy to use. Also, really wonderful graphics. The original had a handful of line drawings, but now we have two and 3D interactive, full color uh, graphics. You can bring up a function, you can put a cut plane through, you can move it, really spectacular. It's online, it's free to use. Please check that out, the DLMF. All right, we have my disclaimer. Okay, I also wanted to talk a little bit about succeeding talks. So today is going to be an introduction. Uh, most of the talk is not going to be um specific. So it's going to be general background of micromagnetics. So whatever micromagnetics you're interested in doing, using, package you're using, this, this talk is, will help you under, understand that. Next week, I'll start talking specifically about um. um so I'll, I'll do a tour of the, of the widget set and also what are some of the problems that uh, arise when you're trying to do micromagnetic simulations. The pitfalls, again, are pretty much general to any micromagnetic simulation. After that, the next two Tuesdays, uh, the 2nd and the 9th of June, I'll be getting into the weeds, uh, more complex, more advanced stuff with them specifically. Uh, on first, the first Tuesday, I think I'll be talking mostly about how you set up and run complex simulations where you vary things like material parameters uh, spatially, uh, how you do um, uh, field pulses, stuff like that, um, how to write an extension. If oomph doesn't, meet, doesn't do all that you need, how do you add on a new extension? I'll probably put that in the, the second the June talk. Uh, maybe also I'll talk about how to run a large number of simulations. So if you're trying to do some parameter study, where you want to vary some parameter and do a lot of runs and see how that parameter affects the results, uh, you need to do some sort of batch processing. I'll talk about that. Mm. Uh, the following Tuesday, the 9th, uh, I'm thinking I'm probably going to talk mostly about uh, uh, post-processing, data analysis, how you make nice pictures and movies, uh, maybe how you create dispersion curves, things like this. Okay. Again, all sessions will start at noon, uh, our time, my time, Eastern time. And today, of course, is Thursday. The next three are all on Tuesdays. So don't miss out. Okay, so here's my uh, micromagnetics in a nutshell. This is my single slide introduction to micromagnetics. Uh, there's an awful lot of information on here that tells you what sorts of problems you can do, uh, what, the, what the scales we're looking at, the spatial scales, the time scales. Uh, this particular part here, uh, you can see it's a multi-layer. We mostly work with thin films and multi-layers uh, just because that's what's of interest, but we can do arbitrary geometries. So long as they're not too big. Um, the micromagnetics is computationally expensive and that if you get too many cells, it just slows down too much. Uh, but these are sort of typical dimensions. We're basically micron size in terms of the outer dimensions. Uh, the cell size, the discretization size is typically on the order of, of a few nanometers, three, four, five nanometers. If you get bigger than that, then you can't capture the change in the magnetization. The arrows here represent the magnetization in the material. Um, this particular color uh, background that's on it indicates the, the angle of the magnetization in the plane of the film. Um, this is an output from, from, there are lots of different, you can have lots of different choices on how you want to put coloring. You'll see here that the magnetization is basically continuous. Micromagnetics is a continuum theory. Um, that's one of the reasons also why we discretize that in the order of a few nanometers. If you get down to atomic scale, uh, then you have to worry about discrete atoms, and that's not what this theory is. This is a continuum theory. So you need to have cells large enough that the magnetization looks smooth. Uh, let's see, this particular structure here, you'll notice that the magnetization tends to want to lie parallel to the edges of the material. Um, this is a pole avoidance principle. If you have magnetization pointing perpendicular to an edge, there's going to be a lot of stray field, and that's um, a high energy state. So when you're looking at a remnant state, this is a, a remnant state here, or any sort of an equilibrium state, the magnetization is going to try to um, Form these, these are called flux closure domains, so you don't have straight field that lowers the energy. Um, you notice the overall, though we have this um, 
sort of clockwise, I'm sorry, counterclockwise circular pattern, but there's two smaller patterns inside. These are called vortices, these rotational things. Right in the middle, you have a spin or a collection of spins, which are pointing straight out of the, of the plane of the film. Um, one of the constraints of micromagnetics is that although the magnetization is free to rotate uh, in three space on a sphere, its magnitude, the saturation magnetization at a particular location is fixed, okay? So it can rotate, but the size is fixed. And that means that when you get to the center here, the magnetization can't just disappear, it has to go somewhere. And so it points out of the plane of the, points out of the film. Uh, so there's two vortices here. And then this middle structure, uh, this is, we call this a cross tie. It goes by other names, but you can see the magnetization comes in and out. There's a lot of stray field uh, in this particular structure. But this is a, a minimal energy state for this particular type of configuration. Um, so, and Mike Minex can explain why this is. Uh, what else? Okay, so I want to talk about the energy terms, the contributing factors. What were the competing uh, entities which cause you which cause you to fall into this sort of a pattern? I think I'll start with the exchange interaction. The exchange interaction is a quantum scale interaction between neighboring spin between neighboring atoms, where the net spin wants to line up from one to the next. And so this is uh, the origin of domains in magnetic materials. It's the origin of ferromagnetism, um, because these neighboring spins here, if you look. In, the region, in, in this simulation, the uh, neighboring cells, the spins want to align due to the exchange interaction. And the exchange interaction is very strong in the near, uh, in close distances. And so that overwhelms, basically exchange overwhelms nearly everything else. And so that locally, you have these uniform regions of magnetization. However, these are magnets. And so each one of these little cells is a little magnet. And if you have two magnets, they see each other through their magnetostatic. Um, interactions. We call this a dipole-dipole or the self-magnetostatic or the DMAG field. Um, it can tend to cause uh, your domains to break up. That's the main thing which means this is the main factor why this entire piece is not just one single domain. Where a domain is a region of magnetization which uh, is more or less uniform. Um, so largely we're talking about interplay between these, these, two, these two energies or these two fields. There are additional energies though in, in sort of basic micromagnetics. One is anisotropy uh, due to the local crystal structure or texturing or other things like this. There are often going to be preferred directions for the magnetization to lie along, okay? And so for example, it can be a very simple uniaxial anisotropy where the magnetization has lower energy when it's lined up in that particular direction. You can have more complicated anisotropies, cubic um, and higher order terms, uh, which we can all we can model all of those. That's a very local term though. And then of course the applied field, if you wanna change the magnetization pattern, you apply a field and the magnetization will tend to try to rotate into the direction of, of that field. And so the patterns that you get depend upon a balance of all of these terms. There are additional terms that one can add. Uh, you can add field, you can add uh, temperature fields, for example, and things like this. Um, some of them are in the oomph package already. Some are extensions that other people have written that you can use. You can write your own extension. Uh, writing a field extension is relatively easy. Uh, I will probably uh, give an example of that in the third talk. In addition to these, to these energy terms, um, which is energy terms are what you need in order to uh, find energy minima. If you actually want to do dynamics, if I apply a field and I want to know, watch what happens as the magnetization changes, then you need to study the, um, the time evolution of the magnetization. And that's given by the landau lichitz gilbert equation. I've written in one form here, this is a landau lichitz form. Uh, and I'll talk more about this later on. But I did, did want to mention the time scales that we're talking about. So the time steps, when you're integrating out the LLG, are typically sub-picosecond, okay? It'll depend upon the material properties and such. But that's typically the, the, the time step from one step to the next. And then you can integrate this over however long you're patient for, but typically the times that we're looking at are at nanoscale. A typical micromagnetic simulation will run for a few nanoseconds, maybe 10, 20 nanoseconds. Um, most of the time, that's what we're looking at. So that's sort of the parameters that we're looking at. Uh, you see the dimensions here. We're, you know, we're working mostly with ferromagnetic materials, iron, cobalt, nickel, alloys. Other stuff can throw in. Um, the model doesn't care. You just feed in, feed in where the appropriate parameters are, but that's typically what we're looking at. Um, okay, so I do have a question up here. Okay, so yeah, uh, they're asking about what language, what language we use for, for oomph. 
oomph, the, the core engine is written in C++. If you're writing an extension, you're going to be writing in C++. We have an interface layer on top of that, which is in Tickle TK. Um, there is a uh, package called Ubermag, which I think we're going to be having uh, some follow-on seminars on, which are, is, provides a Python interface, which sits on top of oomph. So that's where that is. Okay, I'm going to talk about how you can use micromagnetics. Um, and there are a number of, uh, of places where it fits in. So one is if you're trying to design some, uh, some system, some part for some, some purpose, you can use micromagnetics to help you to figure out how big things have to be, how big the effects are going to be, and so on. So it can help with part design. Uh, it can also help with experimental design. If I'm going to run some experiment, I need to know um, roughly what's going to happen there, you know. What's the time scale? If I'm trying to catch some magnetization reversal, what's the time scale on that, right? If, if I can't, if my um, experiment, if my apparatus is too slow to capture that reversal, then I'm not going to be able to see it. So you want to have at least a ballpark idea of how fast things are going to change. Um, also, the, the scales that are involved, how big is the effect? Is it going to be, is the field going to be large enough for me to see in my apparatus? All those sorts of questions, you can get some background information, you can get some ballpark estimates at least using a magnetic simulation. And then after you do the, after you do the experiment, uh, frequently you're not measuring the magnetization directly, but you're measuring some derived quantity like the stray field. And so you're not exactly sure what the magnetization is, or maybe you're passing current through and you're measuring some resistance. And again, you don't really know what the point to point magnetization values are. So um, frequently micromagnetics is used, uh, frequently attached to published papers, trying to explain the phenomena that occurred. So you run the simulation, and you re-derive the quantity that you're seeing, whether it's a stray field or the resistance. And if they match, then you have pretty good confidence that the micromagnetics is telling you uh, that is agreeing with the experiment. And so then you can use the micromagnetics as a proxy for what the magnetization is. Also in magnetics, frequently things occur which are not terribly intuitive. Um, and so sometimes you can use the, the framework of micromagnetics to help understand what's going on. And I'll give an example of that also. Okay. Um, oh, which, what system of units are we using? Oomph is strictly SI. Um, and so be aware of that. We're National Institute of Standards. That's our system is SI. So um, yeah, sometimes you have to do conversions from, from Gaussian units into SI. Is it possible to reduce the size of the elements but have an ensemble of them like in nanoparticles? Yes, you can have lots of different parts. You can have a collection of particles, you can have space in between them. Uh, that first example I showed was multi-layer film with a spacer layer in the middle, but you can break them up into lots of particles. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on right now actually involves nanoparticles, okay? Okay, so this is an early study that I did with Bob McMichael. Uh, uh, oh, I should mention Bob McMichael. Um, he was, um, there were three of us in, in the beginning with him. There was Bob McMichael, myself, and Don Porter. Um, Bob was, is a physicist, I'm a mathematician. Don Porter is, is an engineer, electrical engineer. And so we all brought something to the table. Now uh, this is some early work I did with Bob. Bob is no longer working on, on oomph. He's doing other stuff and he's famous in his own right. Many of you probably are, know Bob quite well. Uh, but I did want to mention that he was very instrumental in the beginning. And he's still, he's, he's still at NIST. Uh, we contact him on a regular basis. We frequently consult. We use him for, for his consultation services. But this is some early work uh, I did with Bob. If you have a long strip of material, um, it's finite width, finite thickness, but infinitely long, and you set it up so you have a head-to-head -head domain wall. So the magnetization is coming in from the left and from the right. And then in the middle, they have to come to some sort of a compromise, some sort of an agreement. And you'll get different sorts. This is a wall. Anytime you have, these are domains on the left and the right where the magnetization is more or less uniform. These transition regions, which are often relatively abrupt, are called domain walls. And for these sorts of strips, there are two uh, most common types of domain walls are this type, transverse wall, where the magnetization mostly stays in the plane of the film. In a thin film, the magnetization wants to stay in the plane because if it points out of the plane, then you get uh, poles on the surface and you get a lot of stray field energy. So unless you have a very strong anisotropy, forcing it out of the plane of the film is going to try to lie in. And so in the transverse wall, it stays in the, it stays in the, in the film plane and just sort of comes up like that. If you have a, a strip which is wider or thicker or both, then you can support what's called a vortex wall. And this has less stray field energy than in the transverse wall. 
and you'll get just a small region in the middle, the, the vortex core, which points out of the plane of the film. And you may notice on either side here, due to topological constraints, this is actually half of a cross tie, and this is the other half of a cross tie. Okay, so the question is, if I build a strip, which of these two walls am I going to see? And it's going to depend upon the width and the thickness of the strip relative to the material parameters. Um, so you know, right, offhand you know that thicker strips and wider strips, you're going to see vortex walls and thinner and narrow ones, you're going to see transverse walls. But it'd be nice to have some quantitative number, you know, some numbers that you can set down and say, well, if it's here, I'm going to see that. And if it's over here, I'm going to see that. So how do you get numbers? Well, you can do a micromagnetic simulation. And this is some work I did with Bob in the very, be very beginning, 1997, where we did a whole mess of simulations. I was talking before about pro batch processing. So we did a parameter study here where we varied the, 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 um, the thickness, and we varied the width, and we ran a simulation. We've got an equilibrium configuration. And then they did, basically, it would always fall into one of these two um, states. And then we could draw the, the line separating them, the curve separating them. Um, the curve, the actual values for the curve are in the paper. Uh, I don't remember what this is right now, but you can look that up. But this is great now. If you want to design a part, you know that if you're working over here, you're going to have vortex walls. If you're over here, you're going to have transverse walls. And especially when you go to look at the dynamics, which type of wall you have strongly affects what sort of dynamics you have when you go try to move the main wall. So this is a very widely cited paper. These are the sorts of things that you can do with micromagnetics. Oh, what are the free energy and boundary conditions? Um, yeah, so typically in micromagnetics, uh, you can add different sorts of surface anisotropies. Um, if I don't, unless I say otherwise, we're working with a free boundary condition, which uh, because of the exchange term means that at the boundary, the magnetization, the, the derivative of the magnetization, the MDN is equal to zero at the boundary. So that's, that's the boundary constraint. Uh, that, that's the only boundary constraint that we typically work with. Okay, you mentioned in slide one is for a given cell, certainly generally films with two larger dimensions. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Um, oh, okay, so yeah, if you're working, if you're trying to do a, a large film, um, the, you can use periodic boundary conditions. Uh, in OMF, currently we support one dimensional, one D periodic boundaries. Um, there is an extension which does 2D periodic boundaries. I'm actually hoping to have support for 2D periodic boundaries uh, by the end of the summer. Uh, otherwise, you have to play some games to sort of fake what happens at the end. Actually, if you go back to this previous slide here, these are infinite strips, right? So what's going on here? Well, I've added, um, I'll talk about this when I get to the advanced stuff, basically added on here uh, some charge to counter the stray field so that there's no, there's no essentially no stray field here. So you do a computation to figure out what the charge would be here and you, you adjust for it. So sometimes you can add on those sorts of boundary conditions also. Um, yeah, some of this gets a little bit more complex though. And then, oh, is it easy to add spin torques in the LLG equation? There are uh, several extensions actually that have done this. Uh, it is a more complicated extension than a field extension because you have to uh, also figure out how to do, how to do the integration. Um, but I'll, I'll see, maybe I'll step through one of those extensions. But yeah, it's not too hard. And if you want to add additional uh, you know, non-field-like terms, uh, you could use that as a base and then add additional terms. Um, I don't think it'd be, I don't think it's a, it should not be especially difficult, okay? Oh, okay, I'm also getting a note here. Please declare a question clearly before answering it. Okay, uh, I'll try to do a little bit better. So here's a question. Uh, can OOF micromagnetic simulations, can you do simulations with antiferromagnets? Um, you can, if you're using an, a, an AFM material to bias a layer, you can measure that you can model that bias. You cannot model the AFM material directly currently in OOF. That is something that we're working on. It's, um, a, little, it's, 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 uh, it's a big step up because you need to, have, you need to model the two lattices and have them uh, co-locate. And so that's something that we're working on. Um, but we don't have it. We don't have it currently. Well, why can't the magnitude change? Okay, so there's a question asking why the magnetization direction can change, but not the 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 moment. And that's just because magnetic materials they have an intrinsic moment, and that uh, 
is, is, is assumed to be fixed in the framework of micromagnetics. Now, sometimes it may change if you, for example, you apply, you have some thermal effects that can, could change. Um, I, yeah, we currently don't have support in OMF for changing the magnetization uh, as a function of time. Uh, you can change it spatially uh, as you go over material, have different material parts. There's no support for changing the magnetization during time at present, although I think there are maybe some, um, some forks of OMF uh, where they, they model something called Landau Lichitz block, where you do allow the, the moment to change. That's certainly a, a more advanced uh, micromagnetics. Okay, it's not, it's not a basic thing. Okay, we're asking, there's a question asking about um, magnetization must obey Maxwell's equations. And where are those in the dynamics model? Those are, in, those are uh, considered, those are built into um, the Brown's equations, which I will get to uh, a little bit later here. I'm going to move on with the talk. We're already, geez, okay, we're already half past. I think we're going to be running long today. This is an example um, of part design. This is a, a zigzag uh, material. We have uh, parameters here, L and W. Uh, actually, W is fixed to being half of L. And we want to do a parameter study where we, where we change the size of L and we get bigger or smaller parts. And we want to know how the magnetization is affected by the part size. Okay. Uh, and so here's some simulations we, we did uh, uh, in the early 2000s. If you have L, if that's, that's this dimension here is 150 nanometers, uh, then you get this nice sort of a ripple. And you can use it, if you put a, pass a current through this, this rippling is going to affect the resistance. If you apply a field, then you can change this ripple, and the ripple changes, so it'll change the magneto resistance, and so you can use this as a magnetic sensor, okay? But it is strongly affected by the part size. As you make this dimension smaller, you get less and less ripple, and you get down to if this dimension is on the order of 50 nanometers, then you don't get very much ripple at all, and the effect on the magneto resistance is going to be very, very minimal. Okay, and so these sorts of simulations were used in this paper, which was published. This is the uh, some of the magnetics people out in Boulder. Um, it was published in 2004, and it also led to a patent, uh, which you can look up in the U.S. PTO database. Okay, here's an example of using micromagnetics to understand what's going on in a, uh, in a, a complex, in an experiment. So this is a mic magnetic force microscope image of, uh, of a ring. It's a permaloy ring. And the field was initially, we applied, first we applied a field uh, downward in the plane of the film to magnetize this thing downward. And then we removed the field and allowed it to go into a remnant state, okay? And so in the remnant state, let's go to an onion state. Um, so this arm is pointing down and this arm is pointing down. Uh, this is an MFM, which is picking up stray field. And so if the magnetization is uniform and, and doesn't have any pulls on the boundary, then you're not gonna see any stray field. And so you basically see no background here. So these are the mains on either side, excuse me. And then on the bottom, you're gonna have some sort of a head-to-head -head domain wall. And the top you're gonna have some sort of tail-to-tail -tail domain wall. And so, and then you're gonna have the, the Light area here indicates a lot of uh, positive charge uh, coming out of the plane. And here it's negative charge, you get flux going into the plane. But this is not looking, if you look at this, what is the details of this structure? It's some sort of a head-to-head -head domain wall, but you don't know what type. Um, and it's weird that you've got these sort of these three blotches here and three blotches there. What's, what's going on there? And so if you look at that, you know, we're scratching our head. We don't know what exactly is happening there. So we did a simulation. And this is the result of simulation, which matches um, surprisingly nicely, actually. You see here the blue areas here, this, the coloring, coloring on this diagram is the divergence of them. So the blue areas, you have positive charge, the red areas are negative charge. And you'll see that just like over here, we have these three regions of positive charge. Here you can see them, okay, quite, quite clearly, and then uh, anasymmetrically up here. And you'll see that actually we've got a vortex there and a vortex there, so there's two vortices. And then we have a half um, cross tie up here and, and, and over here as well. And then over here, there's another half uh, cross tie and then here as well. And so this really uh, helps explain what that structure is, which would be very difficult to do just by looking at the MFM image. Okay, I have a question. Can the simulation in, in <laughs> uh, include DMI? Yes, there's already an extension. It was written by the nice people at RSA. Um, Andre Thiaville, and I forget the name of his collaborator, they've released that extension. It's actually include, I 
think it's included in the latest release of OMF. Um, it's on the website. And so, yes, and you can include lots of things like this. And I'll, I'll talk about some of these in more detail uh, another day. Uh, another thing you can also model is uh, the effect of defects. Yeah, I got a material, I introduced a defect, maybe that defect can be modeled by a change in the anisotropy. And you can see how, what the effect that has when you try to move a domain wall past it, okay? And I wanted to mention this, this is Hironi, this is some very early work in the 1960s before they really had computers that could really do these models. And so he did this by analytic, uh, analytic work. And you can look at the paper and it's like, oh man, okay, somebody's working hard. We then did this and um, uh, we expanded. He did 1D, we did actually a 2D film and we introduced uh, defects and we saw the effect of that. And that was a paper I published some time ago also. Okay, and we extended some of the results that he had. Okay, um, moving time-wise here. Oh, delta is some sort of a, a characteristic length. Yes, it's the exchange length. I'll talk about that in a few slides. I'll define what that is. It, it's a factor of the uh, material parameters. Okay, so we, show, we saw this uh, slide before. Just remember that there, just to recall that there are these four uh, base terms, energy terms that we work with. Here are the formulas for those. These are called Brown's equations. Uh, so uh, Brown put these equations together into the micromagnetic framework in the late 50s, series of papers in the late 50s. He wrote a book um, in uh, 1962, it was published. Uh, I think it's on the, there it is. W.F. Brown, Jr., Micromagnetics, 1962. Uh, you see here, here's the exchange energy. It depends upon the derivative of the magnetization. So the exchange energy wants the derivative to be small, so you get a line basically spins. Uh, the D-mag, okay, well, here's the anisotropy. It's very simple. It's just the dot product of the magnetization with the, with the direction. Um, your easy direction for the magnetization. Uh, you can have more terms here depending upon what type of anisotropy you're modeling. Here's the applied field, okay. The complex term and the thing which makes magnetics hard is the DMAG, okay? So all of these, the energy is you take the local energy and you integrate it over the volume, so the threefold integrals. But the DMAG, you've got that integral over the volume, but then you have this other volume integral which is telling you, uh, summing up the sums at each point, the sum from all the fields from all the other points, okay? So to evaluate this, this is a six-fold integral, okay? And if you have a million cells, then the number of pairs of cells that you need to compute the interaction for would be 10 to the 12th, which is a big number. So uh, that's why micromagnetics is hard, is trying to handle this DMAG term. Now, one thing you will notice though, this part in the bracket, this is a DMAG field. It involves R prime, this is the second uh, variable you're integrating over, but also R minus R prime, okay? So if you look at this, this is a convolution, okay? So if you work with a regular grid, like we do at OOMF, doing finite difference micromagnetics, then you can evaluate this using an FFT, okay? And that's what makes the problem tractable, okay? Now there are other codes, um, other micromagnetics codes which do finite element now uh, modeling, and they're not able to use the FFT for this sort of a computation, at least not directly. And so they have to use other methods to, to accelerate this because you can't, you just, it's too big to, to just brute force it, okay? And so a lot of the details, the computational, um, uh, effects, the things that, that limit us to what we can do, come down to the DMAG field. Okay, um, the other thing, the other factor which goes in is M is piecewise smooth. We have, in, in Brown's equations initially, uh, the magnetization is a fixed magnitude. I addressed that question before. Sometimes in some of the equations I write up, you may see a lowercase m. We use that to denote that the direction of the magnetization is just a normalized uh, value. Okay, a question about the exchange length. So I put uh, L here. In some of the other slides, it's a delta. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. Um, so it's the ratio of the exchange interaction to another, another quantity. So for the soft materials, the one that matters is the uh, micro magnetostatic exchange length. It's 2A over uh, mu naught ms squared. These are SI units here. You plug in the SI units, this comes out in meters. Um, there's another one that can be important, another exchange length, which looks at the ratio of the uh, exchange coupling to the, um, the anisotropy. And again, this is again, it's gonna be another length. Uh, if K is small in soft materials, the anisotropy constant is small. And so this is a big number, and so it doesn't come into play. Whenever you're meshing, you need to look at the smaller of these two. For soft materials, it's gonna be this. For hard materials, it could be this, okay? Let me just go back to these equations a moment. 
A is the exchange coefficient, okay? That's a scalar which determines how strong the exchange coupling is. K is the same sort of thing, but for the anisotropy. And then these other two are just the magnetization. Okay, um, yeah, don't mess any coarser than, the, coarser than the smaller of these two values. This would typically be, work out to be in the order of a few nanometers. Okay, so quasi-static uh, micromagnetics, this is where we're interested in finding energy minima. So if you're doing a hysteresis loop, typically you apply a field and you wait and, well, okay, micromagnetics is working on a nanosecond time scale. So when you're doing an experiment, basically, as you sweep the field, as far as micromagnetics is concerned, you are waiting forever as you move the field. So these are equilibrium states as you're moving along. And they might not be ground states, but they're going to be equilibrium states. And so if you look, the, the curve here represents uh, an energy, the energy surface, and the ball represents the magnetization state. So for example, at point A, we're sitting in a local minimum, uh, and we have some magnetic configuration, okay? That's at some field. Now, if we adjust the field to here, so I'm applying the field in the opposite direction, the energy surface changes, okay? And that minimum that you were in, it's gonna shift a little bit. The ball is gonna track that minimum, which has been shifted, and you get a slightly different magnetization pattern, but nothing, not too drastic a change. But you'll notice that we're sitting in this well, which is getting the barrier to shift, the falling out is getting smaller, okay? If you're doing thermal simulations, at some point, this is just gonna hop out on its own. Even at zero temperature, zero K, at some point, if you make the field big enough, that minimum is gonna change into a saddle point. And when that occurs, you're gonna roll out and find a new minimum, and you're gonna have an abrupt change. And that's this drop that you see in the hysteresis diagrams, okay? So this is one common type of uh, micromagnetic simulation. If you're doing this type of simulation, the fastest way to do it is by doing an energy minimization rather than integrating out LLG. Um, although there are reasons sometimes you might want to do that anyway. But typically, if you're looking for energy minima, you want to do energy minimization. Okay, the other type of simulations we do are dynamic simulations. Um, these involve the lando lichitz gilbert equation. Um, H here, we take all those energy terms that we had. You do a variational derivative with respect to magnetization, and it turns out that that will give you units of amps per meter in the SI units. Uh, this first term, I'm actually going to go to the next slide. This first term is the precession term, okay? So if you have a field, the magnetization is going to process around it. This is basic physics, and you have some coefficients in the size of the field that determine the, uh, the rotational period. However, we know that if you apply a field in this direction, it's not going to process forever. I should mention that as long as it's processing, the energy is the dot product of these two guys. So, so if you're processing and you don't change that angle between them, you're not changing the energy, okay? And we know that over time, if you apply a field, eventually the magnetization ends up going there. And this is the second term in the landau lichitz gilbert equation. This is the damping term. And there's a characteristic, there's a value here called alpha, it's the damping ratio, um, which determines how fast it comes in. And this is, this is the only term here in the landau lichitz form where you lose energy. Um, this term I should mention is not basic physics. This is a complex thing. It's really essentially phenomenological. We know that energy is lost, so we throw in a term. This is what Land Elishitz did. They throw in a term to account for it, okay? Um, and so it models a whole bunch of different things, right? It's energy loss to the lattice, it's spin wave modes, which are too high to, to model, and all sorts of things, okay? And this is just a bucket we dump everything in. It works surprisingly well. There are um, uh, efforts underway, and the people have proposed lots of different things to make this more complex and better model the physics, but we still basically use this because it works fairly well. Okay, here's an example of, of a dynamic simulation. I sorted out the, mag the field, I've applied a field which I've removed, the magnetization is pointing to the right. At time zero, I apply a field in this direction, and then I, then I evolve, okay? So then I do a bunch of steps, sub-picosecond time steps. After 100 picoseconds, I get this configuration. And what's happened is that the middle portion, when it sees the field, it's going to tend to rotate in this clockwise direction. So now it's pointing down. The ends though, because of the canning, and you get this canning trying to because of uh, trying to reduce the, the straight field, because they're at a different angle, they end up rotating counterclockwise, okay? And so by the time you get to 150 picoseconds, you can see that you've got two different domains forming, and in the middle here, you've got this rather complex wall. And if we go on, once you get to 350 picoseconds, you'll see 
that basically what you have here is a 360 degree domain wall, okay? These things are topologically pretty strong. They're hard to get rid of. And in this particular simulation, as we continue to run, what happens is this domain wall actually gets pushed. The middle section just processes around the applied field and these domain walls gradually get pushed out until by the time you get to a nanosecond, they're basically gone. Okay, I just, this is my last bit before we get to the demos. Uh, and I'll do some more questions after I do this. Um, no, okay, I'll, I'll get that later. So I've, I've got a, a strip here. Um, this is a finite strip, but it's very long. Uh, I start out in a head-to-head -head domain wall and I apply it at time zero, I apply a field of 25 millitesla to the right and we see what happens, okay? So now because the magnetization is, because the field is to the right, you expect the domain wall on the left to grow because that's what reduce the energy. And in fact, uh, if you integrate out, you see that's what happens, that this domain wall shifts to the right. This region on the left where you've got the magnetization, we've got a domain wall that agrees with the direction that's of the field, that's growing, okay? So this all makes sense. Now you also notice though that the, wall, the coloration here has changed. This has gone, gone red. And the coloring here is the Z component of the magnetization. Red means that it's starting to point out the plane of the film, okay? So although it's moved down track, also it's starting this, this thing here is starting to rotate out of the, out of the film plane. Um, if you keep going to 360, it's moved down farther, but you'll notice that if you look at that distance versus that distance, it's moved less. And this is the same uh, period, same delta time period. It's also near, now pointing basically straight out of the plane of the film. All right, so now here's the question. What happens on the next slide, okay? Does this continue to go down? Does this stop? Does it go back, right? Well, it goes back, right? So even though the field here, this is a constant field. It's not changing in any way. It's applied, it's fixed, it's uniform across the entire sample, okay? And nonetheless, this wall is starting to move back the other way. It's also rotating back into the plane of the film, okay? And so if you go to 720 picoseconds, what happens is basically this wall has come all the way back. It's now oriented in the other direction. It's not quite all the way back. It slipped a little bit, right? But that's what happened. So, you know, what's going on there? If you continue the simulation, it, cont it goes back down again, but now it's going into the plane instead of out of the plane. And that's why it's blue and sort of red here, but you'll see the same sort of a shift, okay? And then it just keeps going back and forth. Each time you go back and forth, it comes back a little bit, slipped a little bit, okay? And you can explain this in micromagnetics. I'll try to do this briefly because I'm, I'm running a little long here. You apply a field, uh, oh, I should have mentioned back here when I was talking about Atlanta Lichitz. Go back here. Uh, this damping term, it's small. It's 0 0.01, 0 0.001, okay? So this term here is orders of magnitude smaller than the precession term. So when you're looking at dynamics in the short run, right, at the peak of the second time scale, this is the term which is dominating, the precession term dominates. In the long run, this guy takes over, right? So again, it's short versus long. So when you're looking at equilibrium configurations after things have run a long time, this is the term which matters. But in the short run, this is the term which is controlling stuff, okay? And this comes up a lot in the ultra fast dynamics. You typically are interested in what's happening with the precession term because that's what's uh, dominating on the short time scale. And so what happens here is you apply this field, these two domains, they're parallel or anti-parallel to the applied field, okay? In order to move the magnetization, you need to have torque. And if they're, anti if they're parallel or anti-parallel, the torque is zero. So these guys don't see the applied field. In the middle, it's a transverse domain wall. You've got magnetization, which is perpendicular to the applied field. So it sees it, okay? So this thing wants to move because of the applied field. But remember, it's the precession term which dominates on the short time scale. So this guy doesn't rotate into the direction of the applied field. It processes around the applied field. And that's what moves it out of the plane of the film, okay? Now, this is the, the non-intuitive bit. Once this comes out of the plane of the film, you get surface charges, you get magnetic charges on the top and the bottom, producing a DMAG field which points down, okay? Now, this applied field was relatively weak. It was 25 millitesla. This DMAG field, this is on the order of, of a Tesla or a part, part of a Tesla. It's, you know, the MS. And so it's very strong. And so once this DMAG field shows up, this guy is going to start processing around that. And so it's a, this precession around the DMAG field, which causes this guy to rotate uh, clockwise in this case. And it's that clockwise rotation, which moves the domain wall down the, down the track. Okay. Um, 
until it gets all the way up, right? Until we get to this last state. When we get to that state, now this, this middle is pointing straight up. The DMAG field is, is in the opposite direction. That torque is now zero. And so the movement of the domain wall stops. And then once you get past that, then you pick up the, the DMAG field again, and it continues to rotate now clockwise. But now because it's flipped over the other, other side, when it rotates clockwise, that moves the wall back the other direction. Okay. If you keep going, uh, eventually, once you get to the bottom and it goes through to the bottom, then the DMAG field points in the other direction and you get the you get anti-clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. And that, okay, and so you can explain all of that in terms of that. What about energy? All right, what about energy? Well, the precession term doesn't affect the energy, the damping term does. And so what happens here as you move down track, um, energy, you're reducing the Zeeman energy in this part of the domain wall. But here, as this thing is coming out of the plane of the film, uh, the wall is compressing, which increases exchange energy. It's also giving you a lot of DMAG energy because you've got these poles. And so there's being, energy is being, being transferred from the Zeeman energy into these other micromagnetic energies as you move to here. So basically it's like a spring. And then as you move back, those energies swatch, swatch back the other way. The Zeeman energy will build up, but as you come back down from that high energy state, you're releasing these other energies. And this difference here in the slippage that's due to the alpha term, okay? And if you play with alpha, you get more or less slipping here. Okay, uh, let's answer some questions before I get to the demos, okay? Uh, gamma naught, so one question is, in the LLG, is gamma naught gamma times mu naught? No, it's not. It's um, the uh, fundamental gyromagnetic ratio, gamma naught. Um, there are two forms of the lando lipschitz gilbert equation. There's the lando lipschitz form and the Gilbert form. And I, I, I didn't want to get into the weeds of that too much today. But depending upon which form you use, you have a slightly different ver value of gamma. And gamma not just indicates which one that you're working with. Why is it called, okay, so why are simulations called quasi-static and not static? Yeah, they're, they're static in, until we change the field. And then they're not, and then they're changing. So they're, 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 it's, it's step static if you preferred that. Um, in the LLG, when you calculate the modulus, the second, the second term in the right vanish. Oh, um, I, think, I think we're talking about down here. Okay, so yeah, the second term doesn't actually vanish. Um, you'll notice that here we've got a square root of one plus alpha squared. This is the lando lipschitz form. We've got the precession term, we've got the damping term. These two guys are orthogonal. To each other, right? Because you see h cross m here and here. Okay, so when you go to compute the magnitude of this, you just square this, you square this, you add them together. Um, it's easy to add because h cross m is already perpendicular to m, so you can compute that these two guys, the m cross h cross m and the h cross m have the same norm when you divide by the ms here. And so you just add these two together, you just add these, you just square these two things, you add them together, and you take the square root, and you end up with this. It just falls out. Okay, so it does have it. Both terms do show up here in this in this, in this uh, the norm of M, DMDT. I will mention that the Gilbert form, if you just look at the Gilbert form, instead of M cross H cross M, this H cross M on the second term is replaced by a DMDT. These coefficients are tweaked a little bit. The two forms are mathematically equivalent if you adjust these coefficients properly. Okay, if you do that, then these two the two terms in the Gilbert form are not orthogonal to each other. And so um, computationally, um, and for some source of analysis, it's a little bit harder to work with the Gilbert form, but a lot of physicists find it more intuitive. They find that that damping, if you consider the, this term in the Gilbert form as damping, it seems to be more natural and more physically based. Uh, if you look at extensions to the LLG, uh, like when you add in the spin torque term, uh, typically people will start with the Gilbert form and then add this spin torque term onto that, okay? And then you can play a lot of mathematical manipulations to, to make things easier to work with. Um, okay, the, the other questions I have here are kind of long. Uh, <laughs> I think I'd rather deal with those offline or maybe introduce them in the next talk because I do want to get, it's almost, it's almost one o'clock now. And I do want to move on to the, um, to the demos a little bit. So let me just check, make sure I don't have anything else here. Yeah, okay. So here, so now I'm going to move on to the demos. I'm going to talk about NanoHub first. Um, 
it's not really installation because it's already installed for you, but I'll step you through a little bit how you, how you access NanoHub. Then I'll do an install on Windows, which is pretty simple because we have binaries for OMF on Windows. And then lastly, I'll talk about uh, installing Mac OS and Linux, which are a little more difficult because you have to grab the source and build from source. Okay, so first I'm going to go to, to NanoHub. Um, okay, so you go to NanoHub. I'm um, going to have to change that. Okay, uh, you go to NanoHub. Um, I'm going to have some notes here. Okay, you have to log in. Okay. Have to log in. Then we have to log in. Okay, if you haven't don't have an account, you have to create it. Um, okay, once you're logged in, um, you can either go to your dashboard. Okay. And if you have a pretty picture, you can look at yourself. Um, okay, and then you go to My Tools. If you've used OMF, you'll see it under My Tools, okay? If you don't, you can go to All Tools and do a search for OMF. And you scroll down, there are a bunch of things. You want object-oriented micromagnetic framework. That's the one that you want, okay? You can select that, and then you get to this page, and you launch tool. Okay, it takes a moment to come up. The first thing that comes up is this little uh, widget, which allows you to upload or download individual files. If you need to upload or download a large number of files, uh, then there's also an SFTP server that they run at NanoHub that you can use for those sorts of transfers. Um, I will also mention that if you scroll down here a little bit, um, the window that comes up, if it's too big for your screen or too small for your screen, you can grab and you can adjust the size. And it's generally a good idea to do that before you start launching oomph widgets. Let me go just a little bit smaller here. Okay, because I got a small screen here. Okay, eventually what comes up is this little box. Um, don't pay too attention. You need to click first there, and then you need to click here. This would be your, this would be your username there. Uh, this is the machine that you're actually on. And uh, if you click on those two boxes, then you'll get this will come up, right? And this is the main uh, widget for the uh, Oomph GUI. Okay, it's called NM Launch. And you have a bunch of different applications here that you can, you can launch just by clicking on them. And so the one that we're interested in mainly is Oxy. This is the solver engine. These other ones are display widgets um, for output. Okay, uh, again, you, you have to do a lot of clicking for reasons I don't want to go into right now. Um, but you can, basically, you can bring up and bring down the interface to the solver widget, okay? Um, then to load a problem, file load. Uh, let me bring this back in here a little bit. And if you're on NanoHub, when you bring this up initially, you'll have a little directory right here. So this is this is the directory. These are going to be file names here. Um, if you double click on this, it will bring you down into that examples uh, folder. And then there are examples for the different, these are different uh, applications. Uh, in, um, the one you want is OXS, or the OMF Extensible Solver. You go into that, there's a whole lunch list of files here. That MIF, that's the extension that we use for our input file format, okay? Micromagnetic input format, I think it stands for. And so there are a bunch of those here. Uh, let me go down to the very bottom. I have one here called ilio.mif. Okay, this is part, these files are part of any uh, oomph distribution. These are examples that we, we put in. So I'm gonna select that there. And then if I select it here, it shows up load mif file. There's the, the directory, there's the, uh, the file I'm loading. Uh, I'll go into this block um, more detail uh, next time. You can also, uh, Oomph can run uh, threads in parallel. You can specify how many threads that you want in this block. Okay, once I get that, I push okay, and now the problem gets loaded. Now one thing about Oomph is that the solver, it runs in the background. It doesn't produce any display by default. Um, and so if I want to get output, if I want to see stuff, I need to launch some other, some other widgets. 
So today I'm just going to bring up MMDisp, which is uh, for vector displaying of vector fields. And you'll see what that looks like in a moment. If I scroll down here, these are the different outputs which are available from the solver. I select magnetization, and then I say, okay, if I have multiple things up, I may have a long list of possible places I can send it. You pick where you want to send it, which is this particular instance. You see two colon zero, that's two up here, okay? That's how you identify it. And then I can send it every stage, or if I just click the send button, it will send it right away. And you'll see here that I've got uh, a head head to main wall. Now, it's a little bit small here, so I'm going to make this widget longer. And now here's a little trick. I'm going to put my cursor here. I'm going to click and drag. I'm going to get a little red box there. And what's going to happen is it's going to zoom in on that, on that little on that red box. And so now you can see a little bit more detail. Okay. You can also play around with uh, display options here. I go options configure. This comes up. Right now I'm just viewing. Stop that. All right. Let me go back over here. Um, right now I'm only displaying arrows. If I want to have coloring the pixels. Oh, you also notice that the arrows here, you see the subsample three. These are not all the cells. These arrows are not all the cells in the simulation. It's only one ninth of them, every third one in each direction. Um, the pixels by, it depends upon the size of the simulation, but typically zero here means that you're going to have all the pixels are going to be colored. And I'm going to color them uh, using this color map and the quantity I'm going to color is the X, Y angle, say. So if I apply that, then you'll see some nice color. All right. And because I don't have too much screen space here, I'm going to turn off this upper bar just so I get a little more real estate. Okay. And so now I've got that going. And so now I go back to my simulation. If I click run, well, actually, let me do relax first. So relax will basically do one stage. Do we not get that? There we go. And it's very fast in this case. This is a small simulation. Well, if you look on Oxy and you look at help about, you get this little dialog box up. It tells you a bunch of information about the simulation. In particular, it tells you the geometry and the number of cells. So this simulation has only 6,000 cells in it. So it will run quite quickly. Okay. So if you do relax, it just does one stage, where a stage in this case is some number of picoseconds, which I don't remember what it is. If you click run, then it'll just keep going. And it's sending output at the end of every stage to this widget. And so you see the little um, watch that comes up showing that it's, that it's moving. It's moving a little slow. I'm going to reduce how often I send them out. And one of the issues with, with NanoHub is that you're, it's a shared resource. And so depending upon what machine you have and who else is running, things can be slow or not. And I'm sorry, it's going to be a little slow here. I'm just going to stop it. Uh, if I do that, when I go to do this same example on the Windows machine, you can see that this thing actually tracks, goes back and forth down track. Okay. Um, and so that's my introduction to NanoHub. Um, well, it's running print things in NanoHub. When you're done, you can either basically stop your session, keep it for later. When you come back, then you can pick up where you left off, or you can terminate. I'm just going to terminate this one. Okay. Um, another thing I want to mention here while I'm on NanoHub, if you go up to the community and you go down to groups, you get a little search bar and if you search for oomph, you get a list of oomph groups and we're interested in the oomph users group. Okay, so you can go into that. And then down on, if you go to forums here, there are, you'll get to the forum page for oomph, okay? And in particular, at the very top, there's the oomph tutorial, all right? So this is the uh, forum that we've set up for questions for this series. Right now, there's just a one post that I put in that says, um, post stuff here, okay? So uh, let's see if I can get back to, uh, questions. So I'll answer a couple questions. The top one here is Oomph open source software. Yes, it is. Oomph is actually public domain. Um, Don and I work for the U.S. government. Due to by law, works of the U.S. government are not subject to copyright. 
So it's not even one of these open source licenses like uh, GNU or BSD. It's fully public domain. So you can take the source and do whatever you want with it, all right? Um, the second question is, is it possible to use Joomf, Python Jupyter Notebook, for these tutorial series? Uh, the answer is yes. That's not my talk, though. Uh, that's not my series. Uh, we're going to have um, one of the creators of Joomf. It's now become, it's now actually, my, it's now evolved in something called Ubermag. Uh, Joomf is just the earlier version of, of, of Ubermag. And um, we're going to have another, series, another talk, at least one session on that. Uh, Joomf is also on um, NanoHub. And I think they're going to see whether or not they can actually get Ubermag ins installed also. Uh, but you should ask questions about Joomf, you should ask, you should wait for those. <clears throat> okay, one of the questions is, how can I download all .omf files from NanoHub? .omf is the uh, output magnization uh, format that we use. Uh, you can download them one by one by that little widget that shows up uh, when you first launch a session. If you need to do a whole lot of them, though, you want to access via SFTP. And um, there is, uh, actually, when I get back to the OOMF homepage, um, uh, I think it was Tanya put together a FTUG, first time user's guide for, for OOMF on NanoHub. And it tells you all, a lot of these details. And so if you're gonna be using NanoHub, and even if you're not, maybe you should check out that document. And there's a link actually on the OOMF page, and I'll point to that in a minute. Okay, well, next question, can OOMF be installed in Ubuntu? Yes, definitely. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit when I do the Mac install. But yeah, we fully support Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, if you have another variant of Unix, uh, BSD or whatever, yeah, I will install in that. It should not be any trouble. Um, if you do have problems installing, contact me and I'll help you get through it. Uh, how many projects can I make is another question. So in NanoHub, there is a limited number of projects that you can have live at one time uh, for, for the free, um, free uh, uh, account. Um, and again, a lot of these questions are probably uh, accessed on, uh, probably addressed on the first time user's guide. Um, you can also, though, deactivate projects. So you can cycle through, okay? Okay, next question. The program is in parallel performing to use an HPC. Uh, OOMF is multi-threaded. So if you've got a machine that's got lots of processors and lots of cores, yes, you can make use of them. It is not MPI. So if you've got multiple machines, you can't split OOMF, it can't split a single OOMF run up across different machines. Um, however, if you're doing a parameter study, we're running lots of simulations, then of course you can run one simulation on each machine, and on the machine you can make use of all the cores. Okay, um, I'm gonna go on now to uh, the Windows install. Let's see. So, okay, so the first thing is on Windows, you need to have Tickle installed, okay? So this is the Tickle um, language homepage, uh, tickle-lang.org. And if you go down to latest software releases, if you click on this link, you'll go to the source. Um, you probably, I, I don't know of any popular platform where you need to work from the source. Uh, you can generally get binaries to install. Um, for Windows, they actually have links right here. These are, um, well, okay. So uh, two of them are Windows specific, Magic Splat and Iron Tickle. There's also Active Tickle, uh, which I think I'm mostly going to be using because I think it's, it's multi-platform and it's probably the easiest to install. If you click on this and you follow this link or one of the other links, you'll get to an installer. It's a typical Windows installer, which you can, ins which you can then install Tickle on your machine. The one thing you do have to be careful of on Windows is that the binary that we provide is for Tickle 8.6 and 64-bit. So when you go to grab your, your, your Tickle, um, make sure it's 8.6 and 64-bit. Otherwise, it won't work with the binary that we created. Okay, um, Okay. once you've got Tickle installed, then you go to OOMF. Okay, I'm gonna talk here a little bit. This is the OOMF front page, math, NIST, gov, OOMF. If you do a Google search for OOMF, you'll come here. I've put now at the very top, there's a link here to a page, OOMF tutorial series. 
Okay, you follow that link. There's some list of background reading, which you were pointing to before. Um, here's, here's today's talk. The slides are already here. Uh, there's, here's a link to the first time user's guide for NanoHub. You can follow that link there. You can also find it if you have the right uh, search uh, magic on a NanoHub. Um, okay, now that's that page. Uh, I also, okay, so let's go back here. So installing oomph, okay? So bypass that, go down to the software page. We have currently two releases of oomph are out. The 1.2 beta series, this is our stable branch. And then the 2.0 alpha series, this is our development branch. I like the development branch, so that's the one I'm gonna follow. <laughs> You can install either one. The development branch gives you more goodies, but your choice. Okay, if you scroll down on this page, you'll see there's a source and source with pre-compiled 64-bit uh, Tickle TK for 8.6. Okay, you, if you're working with the executables, the executable has to match up with the Tickle TK. Um, I can't say this enough times. We me from my email. I can't say this enough times. Um, you just click on this, and it will download it. Um, I'll go into your downloads folder. Let's see here. I'm going to bring up, I oh, already have it up here, uh, the file manager. And you can see right here, that's the download. This is the one I just did, but this is the one I did yesterday. Okay. If you right click on that and you go to extract all, it'll say, okay, I'm going to extract them to this folder, which is fine. So just click extract. And it will create a new folder. See if I can bring this back up to the top here. This folder was just created by the extraction process. If I look in that folder, underneath that folder, there's a folder called oomph, okay? Now this thing is currently extracting. It takes a little bit. You see here it's 8%. Once it's done, you can take this folder here, which is inside this one we created. You can just grab that thing and drop it wherever you want, okay? Oomph doesn't care where, the, where this file is located. So I did this last night, I waited for this thing to finish and I grabbed that and I dragged it over onto my desktop. So you can put it wherever you want, okay? You open up that folder and you'll see under oomph, there is a file here called oomph.tickle, okay? This is the program that you want to run to launch oomph, okay? If you did the active state install, um, you will have a little icon next to oomph.tickle which will either be a feather or it'll be this little Aladdin's lamp, okay? If that's the case, you can just double click on this and it will launch oomph for you. If you don't have an icon there, then that means that when you did the tickle install, it did not associate the .tcl extension with those applications. In that case, just right click there, find open with, and then choose another app. You won't have these, app, you won't have these options up here in, that, in, in this scenario. You choose another app, um, more apps, and you go down to the bottom, look for another app on this PC. You'll probably want to check this box so that you always use that app. And then you have to uh, move around, work through your file system until you find the, uh, the wish.exe or the tickle sh.exe files, which you then associate with tickle. Once you've done that, then you'll have a little icon. And then you can just double click on this. Okay, and give it a moment. Okay, and now this is the same thing that we saw in the Nano Hub. Okay, this is MM Launch. You bring this up, bring up block, Oxy, like before. Now, one thing I do want to mention here, the reason why I'm going through this exercise, when you go to load a problem, uh, remember on Nano Hub, when I did this, immediately right here, I saw an examples directory. Uh, that has to do with the, the way the file, that the file system is set up at NanoHub. Um, on your personal install, you're going to have a slightly different uh, layout of files. In this one, you need to go to, you need to follow app, applications. When you go down to the there, you go to the bottom there, you'll see OXS, and then examples, okay? App, OXS, examples. And that's where all these files are, okay? And then again, for example, we can load um, yo-yo.mif. We can start an MMDisp session here. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to select 
magnetization output, I'm going to send it in a disk. I'll do it every, let's say every 10 stages. Okay, I'll send the first one out just to get started. Okay, make this window a little bit bigger. So this is another chance to see me walking through this stuff in case you, in case I went too fast the first time. Make this a little bit bigger. Let's go through the configuration. Let's enable pixels. We'll go do this coloration this time. X, Y angle. Okay. And now when I click run, you can see it's starting to move here. Okay. And it picks up steam once it gets going. All right. You can use this little slider bar to keep it in, keep it in frame. And eventually here it's getting up to the point where it's perpendicular and then it starts to run backwards. Okay. That's how you do that. Oh, um, sometimes you'll launch an awful lot of these different uh, applications when you're doing a simulation and going through and killing each one by one is a little bit uh, tiring. If you go to here under MM launch under file, there's an exit all of this will kill all the widgets that you started. Boom, they're all gone. Okay. Do we have any questions on the, um, the Windows install? What's, okay, so one question. What's the basic requirement for Windows to run OMF? Uh, you need to have Tickle installed. Um, that's basically it. The more cores you have, the faster the machine, the bigger the simulation you can run. But uh, you can run uh, pretty minimal stuff. If you can run, yeah. Uh, certainly if you can run Windows 10, you, you can run at least some for some things. Um, the simulation we just saw, that's just on a laptop that I have. It's actually my wife's laptop. So it doesn't take too much. Just some, ask, some questions about GPU support. Um, there was a fork. We worked with uh, uh, Vitaly Lamonkin's group at UCSD uh, some time ago, and he had a student which forked oomph and created a GPU version of oomph, which was regular oomph plus some modules that you could optionally load to run on the GPU. Uh, we had some problem with it shortly. That was C.D. Fu was a student who put that together. After he graduated, uh, CUDA changed the API and broke it. And uh, uh, Vitaly had another student come in and, and fix it. Um, I don't think we have the fix posted. There's been some problems with machines going on and offline. Um, but it's available. We'll make it available. And actually, I am currently working on uh, porting it to inside OOMF proper. Uh, so that it will be available at all versions of OOMF and won't be a standalone fork. Okay. One question. I thought OOMF could only utilize four cores. Can it take advantage of more cores? Or will more cores only allow more inst instances to run? Uh, no, you can, it scales nicely up to however many cores you have. Uh, when you go to launch the problem, you specify how many cores you want to use. On NanoHub, uh, they've had problems with people. If you run too many, if you run more threads than you have cores, it's going to step on itself and it's going to slow down. And if you're using a shared resource, um, that also steps on other people. Um, and so at NanoHub, we put in a little tweak so that they could limit it to four cores. It used to be two cores. It's now four cores as a limit on NanoHub. Um, but on your personal machine, you can load up as many as you want. You do get some diminishing returns, but uh, I run simulations with, well, I have machines that have 72 cores and I use them all and I use the hyper threading. So I actually run with 144 threads running and it, it runs very nicely. What's the main difference between the time driver and the min driver? Yeah, okay, these, these are starting to get into some more detailed stuff and I definitely will adjust, address these issues next time. Uh, we're already running late. Um, I think if there's nothing specific to Windows, um, I think I want to move on to the, the Mac install. Or we'll try the Mac install. But one thing I do want to note here, though, um, before I leave this, if I let me kill this. If you go back, so homework. I do want to mention homework. So the next section is on Tuesday. Between now and then, you should check out the forum. Uh, you should try to get oomph running somewhere so you can play with it a little bit. Whether you're just using NanoHub, which is, is fine, it's great. If you want to install it uh, on your local machines, try to work through that install process. Once you have it going, 
um, you can go to, if you go to the OMF page, and this is a useful exercise in and of itself, go to the documentation section, okay? You can pull up either version, and it doesn't matter. This is the, 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 the alpha version. And this is the online version of the user's guide. If you did a, install yourself on your local machine, you will also have this uh, on the OMF folder under the doc directory. It's OMF doc user guide. You will also have a copy of this, uh, both the HTML version and the PDF version. Um, okay, again, this is the front page for the user's guide, and there is a quick start section here. Okay, so for your homework, once you've got OMF running, wherever it's running, go to this page and step through these um, quick start steps just to get a feel for some of the widgets. There are step one, step two, start, and then launch, which I showed you before. And you can launch other applications. Step 3A, run a 2D problem. Skip that. Uh, I should remove that. That's some software which we haven't really used for 15 years. Go on down to 3B, run a 3D problem. Bring up Oxy, and that steps you through that. Okay. And basically, it will replicate what I just sort of showed you. Okay. We'll work through that to get a feeling for this. And then next, on Tuesday, when I go through the widget demo, you'll understand better what's going on. And if you have questions that arise while you're working doing this, this homework exercise, then you can bring them up uh, either during the session or even better, actually, if you post them um, to the forum beforehand, I can maybe answer them better. Okay. So now we're going to try to do the trick where I jump over to a, a Mac box. Okay, so now this is a Mac that we're looking at and um, going to step you through the uh, install on the Mac. So um, the first thing is you need to install, install Xcode uh, because on the Mac, you need to, going to need to build from source. So you need to have a compiler. Uh, and so basically that means Xcode, uh, which is uh, Apple's compiler. If you go to uh, the Apple that's missing a piece, you go down to the App Store, and you search here and you say Xcode. You'll see here, Xcode Developer Tools. You need to download and install that. Um, it's just this basic, nicely, nicely packaged, just this standard uh, Mac install bit. Uh, it is big though. It's, I think it's several gigabytes. So it does take quite a while to download and quite a while to install. Um, but <clears throat> you need to do that first. Once you do that, then the next step is to enable the command line tools for Xcode. So if I go to the finder uh, and you go down to utilities, if you're not familiar with this, you need to bring up a terminal. Okay. Here's my terminal. And the first step, once you have Xcode installed, is you need to run Xcode select, is it dash or it's dash, I think. Yeah. Um, so Xcode is a command line tool that comes with Xcode. And you can, if you do Xcode uh, dash dash install, this will install the command line tools for the Xcode that you just put in. Uh, I've already done this, I'm not going to do it again, uh, but you need to do that as a first step, okay? Once you do that, then uh, you will have a compiler um, uh, installed. It's CLang, the, C, the uh, C++ version is CLang++. Okay, and so you can see it there. Once you have Xcode installed um, and the command line tools, then the next step is to download oomph and, and build it. So you just go to oomph. Just like before, we go to the software section and we go to, again, I'm going to do the alpha release. And you go down here. And now though, instead of getting the executable for Windows, you grab the source, okay? And then that will get downloaded. All right, once that's downloaded, and that just takes a few seconds, there it's done, it will be in the download folder, okay? So um, if I here, I look at, 
Okay, so I'm going to do a directory listing of the downloads folder. You'll see it's right here. I've got this one after because I already downloaded it. Depending upon your system, uh, you may have a tar. It's it's on on the uh, the home site. It's a tar. It's a compressed tar file. So it's tar.gz. Sometimes when I do this, Mac decides to uncompress it and it gets rid of the GZ and you get an uncompressed version. It doesn't matter which one you got, although of course the compressed version is smaller on your disk. Once it's downloaded, let me just double check here. No, oh, me. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Let me get rid of that. Okay. Um, once I have um, the tar ball down, uh, downloaded, then I just extract it. So tar, extract, file, download, oomph.tar.gz, okay? This command will unpack it. It will unpack it into a directory named oomph, uh, which I already had one, that's why I had to get rid of it. But it will, uh, it just takes a few seconds and it will unpack it. And then I'll have a directory named oomph. You see it's right here. I go into that, okay, and you see the oomph.tickle file again here. Okay, unlike on the Windows though, I'm not ready to run yet because I don't have any, any executables built. So the first step, we need to build the executables, okay. Now on the Windows, um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. You need to have tickle tk installed, okay. Now uh, Mac OS ships with a tickle tk. Uh, if I run if I run the shell tickle sh, I get this little percent sign. That means I'm inside the tickle shell. If you type info pat or pat patch level, pat is short for patch level. It'll tell me that that tickle sh is version 8.5.9. Unfortunately, on the Mac, you need to have 8.6.9 or later, or the um, tk the GUIs are don't display properly, especially if you're in dark mode as I am here. So you need to get a more recent version of Tickle TK. Um, to get out of the shell, you just type exit. So um, how do you get, how do you install a more recent Tickle TK? Well, again, if we go back to the Tickle Devel site, wait a second here. Um, you don't need the source. If you go to active Tickle, you can download its multi-platform and includes a, a Mac image. So you can download and use that and that's the easiest way to go. Um, if you've got Mac ports or homebrew installed on your Mac, you can also install a recent Tickle TK that way. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Um, Active Tickle will install and use our local bin. So if I look in here, I did this last night. Again, it's a, it's a standard Mac package. You download the Active Tickle and you run it and install it. And if I look in user local bin, mm, let me reduce that a little bit here. You'll see I have a Tickle SH there as well as the one that's under user bin. These are actually links down into the library frameworks area. If you're an aficionado, you know about that. The point is that the vanilla oomph that I, the vanilla tickle that I get is going to be user bin, user bin tickle sh, and that's the 8.5 version I don't want. Uh, however, after I've done that active state install, if I do tickle sh, oh, really? Uh, hang on a second. Okay, 869. It's under user local bin. Okay, so now um, when you're working with Windows, you have to be very careful that you download the binary that matches the tickle that you're using. If you're building from source on any platform, um, the tickle sh that you use to build the source is what uh, will control what libraries get linked in uh, to your oomph executable. So your oomph executable will automatically match the tickle, provided you run the right tickle when you do the build. So the build process. Make sure you specify the right oomph, the right tickle, and then it's just oomph.tickle. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is plus platform. Okay, uh, this is our this is our main um, control program. If I do a plus platform, 
it will tell me some information about my install area, what's, what it's going to do when it goes to do the build. So here's the name of the compiler that I'm going to be using. Um, here's a tickle SH. Notice that it's 8.6. That's the one that's running. That's the one that's going to do the build. That's going to control the, the binaries that I get. Um, it also will show you where the SH file is. If you're working, let me just uh, step aside for a moment. If you're working on Linux, okay, you need to also, um, you may already have Tickle, you likely already have a C++ compiler installed, uh, GCC and G++. If not, you need to install it using your package manager, whether that's um, uh, yum or apt-get or whatever. Install GCC and G++. You need to have Tickle TK installed. Again, a lot of uh, distributions include these things already. One thing, though, on Linux is that frequently there are separate packages for Tickle and TK, so you need to install them both. But in addition to the user versions of Tickle TK, there's also a, dev a devel version of Tickle TK. And you need the devel version on Tickle on, on Linux in order to do the build. Okay, if you try to do the build, you'll get error messages. If you try to do the build without the dev version, dev packages installed, you'll get error messages about missing header files. You might also see right here that it's not able to find the config.sh files. Okay, so that's another reason to, to do the plus platform to check to make sure that everything is, is set up okay. All right. Um, otherwise, things, everything, everything here looks good. And so now we actually do the, the build. It's tickle sh. Make sure you got the right one. Oomph.tickle and then pymake. Okay and it will start to do the build, okay? You'll start seeing messages here. You can see CLang++ is doing compile steps, okay? And there are a bunch of switches here. Uh, there are um, some tickle scripts in the directory, uh, config slash platforms, which control this. If you have problems with the build uh, and you refer to the user's guide on the installation section, it will tell you where you need to go to try to fix that up. Okay, uh, let me, this takes about uh, three or four minutes on this machine. So I'm just going to go over now to another tab. And so yesterday I went in and I did the same process and I created a version where I built with them to call SH6. So I'm gonna go to that. Okay, this is just the rename. Once you've got them built, you can move it around. It's, it's not a problem. Okay, so here's my version. Okay, if I run this, if I run platform now after I do the build, um, you'll see there's a couple additional outputs, uh, output lines here from the plus platform. In particular, there's filter sh and, uh, you know, there's filter sh here. And this is, this is a binary that, we, that, I, that you build, that I've built, okay? And so again, everything looks good here. So now to run it, I just tickle sh oomph dot tickle. Or actually, at this point on Unix machines, you can do sl a dot slash oomph dot tickle, and via the magic of tickle, it will run. Okay, and here you see just like before, we get um, mm launch comes up, and you bring things up just like before. On the Mac, of course, you don't have a, a menu bar here; it shows up here, and so here would be file load app uh, OXS examples and just like before okay and so you proceed just like before um, on Linux it's more like the Windows in terms of the interface but this is all the same okay so again um, I'm gonna go here file exit all on to kill everything okay now just so you know if you accidentally build with an 8.5 version of Tickle, then when you go to run oomph, this is what happens. So if you see this, this is what happened. Okay, you don't see anything here. You don't see any text. There you see some text, but this area is blank here, okay? This is what happens if you're using Tickle 8.5. This is what happens if you use the Tickle TK, which comes installed on the Mac, okay? Now, sometimes if you play around here a little bit, some things will come up. It's not as bad if you're on light mode, but in dark mode, this stuff is just, this is just completely broken, okay? 
And so if you see that, that's what's wrong. Okay. Um, I am done with the stuff that I have. Um, so the top question here is, what platform should I choose? Windows, Mac, NanoHub. They left Linux off the list. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm a Linux guy. We do most of our development on Linux. But um, NanoHub is, is great um, if you are, are a low intensity user. You don't need to install anything. They maintain it for you. Um, but it is a shared resource. And so it's hard to do very large simulations. They're going to run slow. Um, you also don't have access to command line, so you can't do batch jobs very conveniently, things like that. Um, but if your needs are modest, NanoHub is a great way to go. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. It's whatever you're comfortable with, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. It's, basic, it's the same on all three platforms. We support all three platforms. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really up to you. Um, it is computationally expensive, so the more horsepower you have, the better. And actually, you can use all of them. So whatever works for you. OK, next question. Would G++ be a suitable alternative? That would remo remove the restriction for Xcode, a very large download. Um, yes, G++ is certainly suitable. Uh, you do need to do a little bit more tweaking. Um, part of the, one of the notes that I had uh, when I was looking into this is, well, okay, how do you install G++? And so I went to look at the, uh, the Mac ports uh, install notes. And the very first thing it said was to install Xcode. Um, so if I have to install Xcode to get to do Mac ports, then I've already got it downloaded. And so that's why I went ahead and did that. And it's the easiest to explain. But no, you can certainly use G++. Um, my main development machine is a Linux box where I use G++. Um, you may run into, if you run into some problems, uh, shoot me an email and I'll help you clear that up. But yeah, no, I, I have done builds with G++ on the Mac. It's not a problem. Next question. Can one install the alpha and the beta version on the same Windows machine? Yes, you can. Um, no particular problem. Just put them in different directories. Uh, one issue is if you try to run them at the same time, they will, there will be some crosstalk between them unless you change the oomph port setting. Um, and I'll try to remember to put a note up on this. Um, there's a config file uh, under the oomph folder called config slash options dot tickle. And in there, there is a port number that uh, the application is going to be listening on for communication between the different devices, between the different widgets. And if you change that, if you have a different port number for the two installs, then they'll work great alongside each other. You can run them at the same time, no problem. Otherwise, you can only run them one at a time. Question, is there a demonstration on how to install it on Linux? <laughs> uh, I would do a demonstration on Linux. Uh, the problem is that Zoom is currently not allowed on the NIST network, and all my Linux boxes are on the NIST network, so I couldn't do that today. It's basically the same as the Mac. That Mac command line is uh, it's, it's a bash shell, just like you will have on Linux. So the only difference is, is you have to, it's a little bit different in terms of getting your Tickle TK installed, uh, making sure you have G++ installed. And as I mentioned uh, on Linux, the Tickle TK typically comes in four packages. Uh, two are the standard use, user package, and then there's two dev packages. They're usually tickle-dev and tk.dev or something like that. Do a little search in your package manager to find those, install those. After that, uh, you run PyMake, just like I showed you on the Mac. So it's tickle sh oomph.tickle PyMake, and it will build it. And the rest then is the same also. Um, it would be good if we get to know how to construct a MIF file from scratch. Perhaps this is included in the next talk. Yes, this is included in the next talk, all right? Uh, what's the main difference between the time driver and the min driver? Okay, this is a little bit more advanced. You have to, the person who wrote this obviously has been playing around with MIF files a little bit. The time driver is the one that you use with the LLG integrators, like uh, Runga Cut a Solver, okay, or the Spin Torque 
um, evolvers. I call those evolvers. So you have to match the driver to the evolver. So if you're integrating out LLG, you're going to be using the uh, time driver. And if you're doing energy minimization uh, with the um, conjugate gradient solver, uh, then you need to use the min driver. Um, how does it affect the outcome? Uh, this is a continuation of that question. How does the min versus the time driver affect the final minimized state? If you use a time driver, and you're probably going to kick the alpha up so it doesn't take the damping up, so it doesn't take forever to get to the, to the equilibrium state. Um, if there's only one equilibrium state, they're going to be the same. If there are multiple equilibrium states, then which one you go to can depend upon how you go searching for it. Okay. Um, if there's only one state, if you're in the, um, the basin of attraction of a minimum, then it also doesn't matter which, which, which one you do. Uh, the other difference, though, is the conjugate gradient solver is usually much, much faster, can be orders of magnitude faster for finding the minima. And I will talk about that in the next talk also. OK, please, next question. Please elaborate more on the functioning of the run and relax buttons in the Oxy interface. How are they different? Um, inside the MIF file in the driver, you specify what constitutes a stage. So runs are broken up into steps and stages, or iterations and stages. And uh, when you're inside a stage, um, all your inputs, in particular your applied field, and if you have currents and stuff like that, they're, con they have to, they're supposed to be continuous uh, and actually smooth, continuously varying uh, and, and differentiable throughout the stage. Uh, between stages, the solvers get restarted. The, LOG, the Runga Kutta solver, for example, gets restarted. And between stages is where you can have um, convenient breakpoints for that. Uh, the other big thing about the stages is if you want to do some spectral analysis on the output. So you want to output every picosecond, or I'm sorry, uh, not every picosecond, but every 10 picoseconds or something, if you want to produce output. You can, you may remember on the Oxy interface, you can select output to come every so many steps or every so many stages. If you, in your input file, you specify that I want a stage to run 10 picoseconds, say, then in the, um, the Oxy interface, I can say, okay, dump the magnetization every stage, and that will give me output every 10 picoseconds of simulation time. And then that allows you to have regular time steps that you can then feed into a, a FFT in order to, to look at the spectrum. Okay, uh, I guess I have to scroll up here. Oh, and so that's the stage. And so uh, the relax button just runs to the next stage and then stops. The run button, it runs until the end of the, it keeps running. It goes past the stages. When it passes the stage boundary, it will do any output which is scheduled for the stage. And it just keeps going until you get to the end of the, of the run. Okay, um, is the install for the Mac the same if we would like to run the Joomf library through Anaconda Jupyter Notebooks. I'm not certain. You're going to have to ask the Joomf people about that. Would it be possible to run Oomph in the cloud? For example, Google Cloud Lab. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question either. It's not something I've looked into. How to do batch process in Windows. Uh, I'll talk about that next time. Um, there are uh, pretty sophisticated batch processing facilities in Oomph. Um, you can write one MIF file with a parameter keyword, and then every time you launch it, you just change the command line what simulation you want to run. And I'll talk about that next time. Hopefully next time. If not, then the time after that. Okay. Um, and again, how do you do a batch process in Windows? Um, you have to drop down the command line on Windows. Uh, but then it's going to be the same as on, on Unix or on the Mac. Instead of Oxy, you run Boxy, B-O-X-S-I, and you specify the MIF file that you want to run. And again, I'll, I'll go over that next time. Okay. Um, I'll, take, I'll take two more questions here, I think, and then we should probably stop. Um, we're almost two o'clock. Um, where are the contributions from the damping-like torque and field-like torques? Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I uh, talk about the, the spin torque module. I know that's of interest to this, this crowd. Um, but yeah, they, they work with a 
Well, there's a couple ways to do it, but typically what happens is the extensions have a modified version of the LLG where they come in and they have two additional terms, right? They have the adiabatic and the non-adiabatic term and they come in and they modify the, um, the, the system that you're, that you're integrating. What's the driving force for switching at 0K? Um, at 0K, what happens is nothing switches. If you're in a minimum, nothing switches until the minimum disappears. Um, and so you adjust the field and your minimum changes into a saddle point. Um, you are not going to be exactly on the saddle point. You're going to be a little bit off. And so there will be some torque to drive it out of, out of the saddle point. Um, yeah. I mean, in, 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 in principle, you can, I used to actually have a little nudge field in there to kick it off the saddle points, but it doesn't seem to actually be a problem because we're never exactly in the saddle. And I'll talk a little bit more about this actually the next time when I talk about pitfalls. When you go to discretize the system, you introduce all these little uh, divots in the energy surface due to the discretization, which also sort of affects things a little bit. And I think that's enough for today. Um, you want to let's say a few. Oh, let me just before I finish, though, just to remind people, um, please do uh, play around with the, with the widget set. Uh, look at the quick start page in the user's guide. It's useful to explore the user's guide a little bit and uh, use an NLHub forum. So uh, I know, Jen, do you want to say a few concluding remarks? Oh, no, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for this uh, very informative uh, lecture. So for the uh, audiences in Zoom, if you want to uh, uh, applaud, actually, you can do that in, uh, virtually by clicking the uh, reactions button at the bottom of the screen. And you can choose uh, um, applaud or thumbs up. And uh, um, I also want to thank everyone for participating. All of you have been uh, very uh, well behaved and uh, following the, the rules to make the, the tutorial go smoothly. And uh, yes, definitely do the homework, try to practice that so you're well prepared for this uh, 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 more advanced lectures uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, that'll be all from uh, me. Kirill, do you want to add anything else? Um, no, I don't think so. The only thing is, uh, if there are people who are interested in Spintronics, but they're not signed up for the um, Spintronics seminars, please do sign up. Same website, uh, spintalks.org. There's a separate sign up for those seminars. So um, uh, take a look at that. And you can also watch the recordings of uh, previous talks. Right. And also, there's uh, questions about the video recording of the tutorial. We should be able to finish uh, editing that uh, by the end of today. And the post that that will be also posted on the spintalks.org website, most likely on the, the, the tutorial web page. Yeah. So in fact, the uh, the uh, live stream on Twitch should be available immediately after it ends, um, but a edited video will be available a little later. As Shin said, at spintalks.org. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that'll be all for today's uh, lecture. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, I will see all of you next uh, Tuesday then.